right. Let's get this out of the way first. The thoughts, views, and opinions expressed on Tailboard Talks Firefighter Podcast are solely those of the speakers, guests, and host, and do not in any way represent the thoughts or views or opinions of any other employer, partnership, or sponsor. The material and information in this podcast is for general information purposes only and should be used at the listener's discretion. What's up, everybody? Welcome back. My name is Chris from Fourth Shift Firefighter, and this is the Tailboard Talks Firefighter Podcast. Welcome back to the garage. We're gonna do a quick one today based on promotional testing season. Now I said I would do this, I would kind of recreate this one that me and Patrick did a few years ago. It's gonna be different though, because I have two or three tips for you today. Actually I have three, three do's and one don't of uh, promotional testing season. But before that, make sure you go check out my affiliates, Rescue One CBD and Fourth Frontier. Rescue One CBD is 0.000 THC down to the billionth. Uh, so they want you to have all the benefits of CBD without any of the risk of failing a drug test. And they even ship a drug test with their CBD package so you can test yourself if you like. It's going to come up negative. Go ahead, but go for it. Um, and then Rescue One, no, sorry, Fourth Frontier heart rate monitoring strap, maker of the X2 it's a heart rate monitoring strap. And it's the only one in the industry that shows lead to EKG. So all the other stuff that you're used to, plus you can look back and see what lead to was doing the entire time you were recording. You can also do live lookings also. Now I mentioned those two things because one, they're affiliates. Two, I've been using the strap for my training rides for this big gravel race coming up. Now it's a race, it's more of a ride for me, more of a survival series for me, 77, 78 miles of basically just rolling hills. And uh, it's gonna be tough. And I'm like a week and a half, two weeks away. It's on the 24th uh, is the race, August 24th. And I started like, I don't know, I call it panicking in the past week or so of like, oh, I should really, just looking at my bike, like, oh, I should really get a, a, a lower stem. I should try that. That'll make me faster. Or like, I think I need a new pair of bike shorts. I think, I think I just need a new pair of bike shorts. Or like, I think I'm going to get a new bike computer just so I'm ready. Like all these things that I don't need and I really should not do, but um, it's like getting down to crunch time. So I'm like, oh, I need to, I need to change something or I'm missing something, right? Something's going to be the, the golden ticket for making me survive this thing, right? When that's not true, like I should be trusting of the work I've put in and understand like I can literally walk this thing and finish the next day and it has no impact monetarily or professionally on my life. Uh, the kids will still love me when I come back home. So it's just a stress thing, right? You start looking for all these things at zero hour that you think you need to make yourself successful. And I was talking to, because we have a test coming up in about a month and a half, I think promotional test coming up in about a month and a half. And I was talking to some guys that are taking it and I was trying to relate to them. And it's the same lessons, man. It's the same thing as I was talking to a probationary guy the other day. When you get stressed and when you get um, nervous and when the big event's gonna happen, that is not the time to be trying new stuff. That's not the time to be figuring out new ways to do stuff, experimenting, testing out new um, techniques. Like you should be doing what you know how to do very proficiently and sticking to it and being confident about it and not freaking out and trying to invent a new way to do something. Now, recently I used that with a guy, a probationary guy who's on a roof simulator and he's getting tired. So he completely adjusted his swing because he was getting tired to like a hand position he'd never used before and even thought about picking up a tool that he'd never used to cut a vent hole before because he's like, I just gotta try something else. I'm getting tired and this isn't working. That's not the answer. It might be the answer sometimes to pivot. Don't be afraid to pivot, like adjust your tactics and, and make changes on the fly, right? But in that position, what we have to do is just go back to our fundamentals and be more solid and more accurate and more deliberate with our movements. So there's no wasted movements. There's no wasted effort and you can get through it without feeling gassed instead of now, not only are you introducing this X factor, this new tool in your hands, but you don't know how hard you have to hit the roof material with it. You're not sure what the recoil's like. You're not sure how the swing should be, like the handle's shorter. All these extra variables, but you thought you had to do something different because plan A wasn't working. Sometimes plan A is still good. It just needs to be better executed. It's a good plan. It will work. You don't need to go to plan B all the time. You just need to make sure you're planning A. You're doing plan A as it was intended to be done. And I had the same conversation with one of the guys taking the promotional exam. On test day, it's not a time to make stuff up or think of like, oh, I got this nice new angle I'm gonna try. Test day is show me what you've perfected in the past three months of having this material in front of you that you should have been studying. 
Show me that you know this stuff. Don't try to dazzle me and bring out new stuff that isn't in the industry or anything like that. It's there to see how well you can present the material they've given you to know, right? And so that's not the time to start inventing and creating new stuff. Same thing with the bike race. And that, so in here, I have three points. One, two, three. I got them right here. To hopefully, hopefully keep you from panicking, okay? Or if you see someone, even if you're not testing, and you see someone entering the test, this, these will be good jumping off points for getting them ready to go or giving them tips and tricks on how to get it going. Or you can send them this episode and look back about a year with me and Patrick about testing, uh, promotional testing season. Um, but this is a good starting point. So the first one is a lot like I've been talking about. Make a plan and trust the plan. When you enter the promotional testing pool, 18 months ahead of time, if you join the acting officer program or whatever, you make that plan and then you just trust that plan and it becomes even more obvious and more important when you get your material, when you get your thousand pages, thousand pages plus of material. For the first test I took, it was 1300 pages of material between the books and the SMOs and the SOPs and union stuff. Um, all that stuff was 1300 pages for a 100 question test. And it was a real bummer when you're reading and you're like, all right, I've read 13 pages. Maybe there was one question or not in that material that I just read. And it's just a long process, but you have to set up a system that you can trust that even if you read those 13 pages and there was one question out of that 13 pages or 12, that you've gotten the information you need to get out of those pages. So if it does come up, you're ready. Okay. And for me, that was breaking it down, looking at the gross number of pages and breaking it down of how many days I have left and building in days where I wouldn't be doing that stuff. And then looking at the events of the assessment center and what those entailed and then breaking that up and, and doing like, I'm just going to focus on this one for this week and the next one, the next week and the next one, the next week, and then rotate through, um, and sticking to that. Let's say I had 30 pages of reading material a night, regardless of what it was, 30 pages, raw pages, and then an hour of assessment center. If that's the plan, then that's the plan. And if I feel good at the end of that and I'm like, I'm awake, I'm engaged, I would still cut it off at the, that, stick to the plan because now you're robbing from tomorrow. Okay. And you can work ahead if you're like, I got something going on this weekend. I want to tack an extra hour on. Sure. But it's easy to work ahead and blow the plan the next day. And it's easy to fall behind and blow the plan for the rest of the week. Stick with the plan, trust the plan, because then you can look back at the end of the week and say, I did exactly what I was supposed to do at the end of the month and say, I did exactly what I was supposed to do. Not get the end of the month and say, my goal was to do this. I had a couple days where I read over, a lot of days where I didn't read as much. So I'm actually behind like 200 pages. So now I gotta make that up on the back end somehow, or I'll just skim those pages and hope that nothing's in them. Stick to the plan and trust the plan. And know that you've made a good plan. And if you just work it to the end, it's gonna give you the results you want, but don't panic, okay? Don't panic. Now making the plan is important and who you involve in making the plan. Consult people who have tested before. Consult people who have done well on tests before and who didn't feel like this test was the absolute end of their being or didn't pretend like they weren't doing anything and just gave it a half attempt. You don't want those people either, okay? And that's actually, actually a bonus point in here that I should have been a full point. Don't ever take a test just to take it. This whole thing about, I'm just taking the test to see the process and I don't really, I'm not really competitive for the position, but I wanna see what it's all about. Such garbage, in my opinion. And I know that's a harsh take. I know there's value somewhere in pretending like you care about this thing, but it doesn't prepare you at all for the next time when it really matters. And this fire service changes so dynamically that, I mean, my testing path is an example of that. The first test I took, I didn't have any of my education any of my officer courses. I was junior in the testing pool. Um, I got one chief's point because I wasn't involved in anything. I didn't show any really like, I wasn't in the, the lane of testing, right? And I hadn't been proven in that position yet. I wasn't in the acting officer program, nothing. I didn't even make the list because at that time we had 20, 25 people taking the test and they only keep the top 18, I think, at the time. So I did, uh, I, did, I took the test though, and this is how I suggest everybody take the test. Either take the test like you're number one and you're trying to run away with it and people are chasing you, or you're number two and you can catch number one. 
If you're doing anything besides that, you're setting yourself up for failure the second time you have to take the test. Now it actually matters. And if you just floated through the first time, you have no scope of how much time this is going to take, how stressful it's going to be, what the actual preparation for it's going to be, how you're actually going to feel on test day when you're nervous because you hope so much that you prepared well enough to catch somebody or beat somebody or run away with this thing. Yeah, you went through the process the first time, but all of the emotions that are going to come up the second time when it matters, you're not going to have those the first time when it doesn't. So that's always my advice. Take the test as seriously as if you're number one and you're looking to run away or you're number two and you're trying to catch number one. It's the best mentality to have with these, these promotional testing processes. Don't just take it to take it because you're not going to just, you're not going to get anything out of it. You're not going to get the experience of being stressed and devoting time and disrupting your family and um, the weirdness that happens with your study group when you start to like get close to the finish line, you start like pulling back a little bit and maybe not telling them the full answer you would actually say in the assessment center when they say, why are you good for this job? Maybe I'll just give them not like half of it and then I'll keep the rest for myself, but I'll practice it at home uh, so they can't hear my golden answer I know that I got from other guys in the department that have worked before. It gets weird. That was a caveat. That was a side little side quest on that one. Make a plan, trust the plan. Now, number two, practice out loud and practice with the people that matter. And there's a subcategory to this one too, which is actually the don't of this list. But you have to practice out loud. The gap between your brain and your mouth is like five miles apart for a lot of us, for a lot of different reasons and in a lot of different circumstances and situations, but especially in the promotional testing room where you can run through this perfectly crafted statement in your head and it gets out and it's like, I would just put water in the fire. It's just something dumb comes out, right? Getting used to saying things out loud and then recording them and hearing yourself speak or recording with people that you can't BS or, um, I'm sorry, practicing with people you can't BS or practicing with people that on the opposite end of the spectrum, have no idea what you're talking about, but you have to practice sounding confident and making concise sentences where they can say, I don't know what a transitional attack is, but you sounded like you did it in the right spot and you knew what you were talking about because you worked it in really well. You have to practice out loud. Now, the second part of that is you have to practice with the people who matter. And by, what I mean by that is do not be afraid to go above you and ask for help and audience with your practice. Go to captains, go to battalion chiefs, go as far up as you can until it gets like to a conflict point and ask people, can I practice this in front of you? Because they're not the ones writing the test, but they've been around your department for a long time. And you might have an idea of like, all right, first company is going to do this and second company is going to do that. And they'll be like, why would, that's not really how we do it. Like it's how you can do it. And it's definitely what some guys here have done. But traditionally, here's an effective tactic. And now you have the playbook, right? So don't be afraid to ask for audience above your rank to practice with. The last thing you want to do is be really, really confident in the wrong information on test day and present it very eloquently. And they run on the checklist. They're like, well, he has no idea what he's talking about. And that was wrong. And we're not even going to talk about that one. And you get a bad score, but you present, presented it really well. Remember, your department is setting the score sheet that the proctors are grading you on, right? It's not like this third party company comes in and says, we're bringing our rules and our, our questions and it has nothing to do with your department. They sit down and say, all right, we're gonna test your people. Give us, give us the playbook. Give us what you want us to test them on and we'll do that. So getting information from your department is extremely, extremely valuable. Now, the second part of this is do not test. That's not it. Do not study with anyone you don't wanna see promoted before you or ahead of you. Dude, stuff gets so weird in the testing season. When I was testing the second time, the, the one I got promoted off of, I, I was in a group with two of my really good friends. And both of those guys, we had a conversation in the beginning because I had been through it once already and I saw the weirdness and they hadn't. And I said, things are gonna get weird, dude. We're gonna be the best of friends and we're gonna help each other in the initial stages. The first two months are going to be awesome. We're going to be meeting up for coffee and testing and uh, quizzing each other and all this. And then like a month beforehand, things are going to get really weird. We're like, you're going to naturally start protecting information you have. And you're going to learn stuff along the way, like I said, from other audiences that you practice with. And you're going to be like, well, that's a really good part. I should put that in. Then you'll meet up with your study group and they'll be like, all right, what do you know about this? You'll be like, I, I still got to figure that out. And you know, like you got this little thing that you, you think is good. But it's competitive. It's a competitive testing process and things are going to get weird. Don't 
study with anybody that you don't want to see promoted before you or ahead of you. Okay. And I, we had that conversation, like I said beforehand, I said, I got no problem with either of you two getting promoted before me. So I'm not going to hold back. And admittedly, all three of us held back. Like it just happens. It's just part of the game, man. But if you go into a group, a study group with someone, you're like, I really cannot stand this guy. I hope he does not get promoted before me. And then it comes like, all right, Chris, run through your first in stuff. You're not going to want him hearing what you have to say because you know he doesn't know what he's doing and he hasn't put in the time that you have and you don't want to show off in front of him and have him write down everything and now you're on the same level, right? Don't study with anyone that you don't want to see promoted ahead of you. All right, we're getting to the last points here. The last point and the third point is let it be the immense pain in the ass that it's meant to be. I was talking with someone else who's going through a test this time and it's just... Without getting too involved in our department dynamics, it's gonna be a very young testing pool and a very tight testing pool. And there's a very clear division about halfway through of like top half, bottom half. So if you're in the bottom half, it's very easy to say that thing I said before, of like I'm just gonna go through it to go through it. Don't really stand a chance here, but I wanna see the process because in three years I wanna be um, top of the list. But it's a small pool and like I said, it's very tight. Now there's a division line, but our department is so dynamic and it's gonna change so fast that you could be number eight on that list and looking down the barrel of promotion in two years. This person said, well, I'm studying, I'm doing a good job, but I'm really not letting it be that much of an inconvenience at home. I don't wanna devote that much time to it that it really creates stress at home. And I said, let it create stress at home. Let it be a major thorn in your family's side. Let it be a major thorn in your side. That's two things for me, an indicator that you're doing it right in my opinion, and I know that sounds self-destructive and dumb. It's an indicator that you're giving it the importance and the time devotion that I think it deserves, is that you're noticing some sacrifice has to go on. Now, side note on sacrifice, misnomer here, you're not sacrificing anything. So let's get that straight. Your family is sacrificing a lot. You're doing the thing you want to do to get the thing you want. They're letting you do it and, and bearing the extra work because you're at the library studying for three hours a day. So. That's just a little personal bone to pick I have. Um, I heard that a while ago of like, when you talk about sacrifice, realize that if you're the one pursuing something, you're not sacrificing anything. You're going for what you want. The people around you are sacrificing anyways. Anyways, let it be a disturbance. The second thing that does is that lets you see what this position is about. It, this position is a disturbance to your personal life. Getting promoted in any form or fashion. If you have engineer as a promotion, promoted rank in your department, safety officer, training officer, lieutenant, captain, battalion chief, each level you go up, each level you go up, that position is a greater inconvenience to your life. There are people, obviously, and you know them, they're officers that can literally leave shift, turn their phone off, come back two days later, and they've completely separated from the department in that time. I don't think that's a good way to do it. I think you can pull that off if you're a blue shirt, if you're riding backwards, if you're on that ground level task oriented level and you're not responsible for anybody, go ahead. As soon as you step forward and say, I want to be in charge of a crew or a station or a shift, I think with that comes responsibility to be accessible and to be engaged and to be inconvenienced by the people that you're leading. I believe that. So let it be an inconvenience now because it's going to be an inconvenience later if you do get promoted. And it's not all bad, right? But you are going to get phone calls and say, hey, I'm calling in sick tomorrow. I've called in three times this week, but my wife is sick and blah, blah, blah. Or three times this month, but my wife is sick. So just letting you know what's going on. That's going to take up some space in your brain. You're going to know you got multi-company training coming up two shifts from now and you got a new guy that doesn't know what he's doing. That's going to take up some space in your brain. You're going to know that you made a mistake last shift. And the chief knows about it. And it wasn't that big of a deal, but you're going to have a meeting because you're responsible for everything that happens on that scene with your crew. That's going to take up some space in your brain. Let this process take up some space in your brain in the short term. The other reason for that, maybe the third one now, I'm not counting, is that at the end of the test, it's competitive. And you're going to look, and it always comes down. First five spots come down to tenths of points and sometimes hundredths of points, right? That's how ours was. Number one was runaway. He was three points ahead, and then me, number two through five, were all within one point. 
So you split one point four ways and that was the next four spots. There is no doubt that it's an inconvenience now putting in the time and effort and going above and beyond and really drilling down the work it takes to prepare for this test. If you get to the end and you were one question or 0.3 away from getting promoted, now you have three years to think about that. Three months of really hard digging down effort might be worth it if that means you don't have to wait three more years to get promoted. So let it be an inconvenience now. So maybe you don't have to think about it ever again. Maybe if you just dig in and let it be an inconvenience and a hassle to your family and they sacrifice and you have some tough moments and tough decisions about being away, maybe it's going to be worth it because three years from now, they won't have to do that again. Maybe. Okay. But let it be an inconvenience. Let it be as torturous and as agonizing and as mind numbing and frustrating as it should be. Um, Cause that's what it is. And the job is awesome, right? Being promoted, in my opinion, is better than not being promoted. But it comes with numerous times in the past four-ish years I've been promoted where I've had as much stress as that testing day just from everyday stuff, from personnel stuff, from scene stuff, from um, professional stuff. That stress you feel going through the process and preparing and then on test day, that stress you feel doesn't go away. So you might as well get your first run at it and get your practice and get good with it or get familiar with it during the process. All right, this was way longer than I expected. I hope it made sense. I hope it helps some of you guys out there. It's easy for me to sit back and say it now because I did my test. I did my two tests. I got promoted. I don't have any aspirations in the next four, five, six, seven years of going for captain. So it's easy for me to sit back and say, you need to work harder. You need to dig in. You need to blah, blah, blah. Um, but I did that. I can confidently say I did that. And yeah, I had to test twice, but I got through on the second one and I'm glad because of how tight that second group was. I'm so glad that I did the things I did the way that I did them to get promoted earlier than later on that list um, and not have to take a promotional test the third time for lieutenant. And if you do, then you do, right? But don't, don't sacrifice your first one and don't let up on the third one. Like you, can, you can do it. Stick with it. All right, but don't cheapen it by, I don't care, no big deal, I'm just gonna take it to take it, or whatever happens, happens. My fourth time taking it, what are the chances now? Man, it's tough. I'm fortunate, like I said, I didn't have to do that, but a lot of people do. Talk to them, get your support system going, hammer down, it's three months. Three months from the time they announce it to test date. 90 days-ish, right? Hammer down, you can do it. We'll go out for beers afterwards and we can talk about how bad it was. Um, if it's during the 14-ish, I'll be on the weekend. All right, guys. Thanks for letting me ramble. Thanks for letting me talk. Thanks for hanging out with me. If you like the show, donate coffee money. Go on the Buy Me a Coffee page. Send me three bucks. Check out my affiliates on the website. Those guys are awesome. They got discounts on the website. My fourth shift firefighter website, number 4TH Shift Firefighter. I'll talk to you soon. Be a fourth shift firefighter again. And uh, let's all keep working on being more capable and durable on the job and away from it. Cool.